listening to History Man 1781, a project of ekbarns.com. Coming to you from historic Camden, South Carolina, walking in the footsteps of heroes and proclaiming freedom reigns. On today's podcast, we are privileged to have Charles Baxley, publisher of the Southern Campaigns of the American Revolution. Welcome, Charles. Welcome. I'm glad to be here at Historic Camden. The, uh, the history around Camden is just fascinating to me from a, from a liberty standpoint, from the American Revolution standpoint, and often it is a history that is not told. It is, uh, it is put into the background on the back pages of the Northern Campaign. I think our listeners will be fascinated by the stories that come out of Camden and, and how this is an epicenter of the Southern Campaign. Uh, tell us a little bit about one of the battles here well, um, at Historic Camden, this is where um, the original colonial village was, and the British came here in 1780 to make a forward base where they would ship supplies to and have a jail, hospital, um, place where you could get your guns worked on and your horses sh shod and things like that. And so it was an important uh, strategic point in the road system of the 18th century. So there are two important Revolutionary War battles that were fought right in this neighborhood. The first in 1780, the Battle of Camden, which I think Dr. Dunaway has talked with you about. And today, if it's okay, I would like to talk a little bit about our downtown Camden battle, the 1781 Battle of Hopkirk Hill. That is great. I'd well, love to hear about that. There's very little written about that particular battle. And uh, it really is kind of a, a quintessential Nathaniel Green tactical battlefield, if, if you will. So I'd love to hear about it. It's very interesting that um, Nathaniel Green, after fighting the bloody fight at Guilford Courthouse in March of 1781, chose to come back to South Carolina and try to defeat the British in detail, taking all their posts and all their internal communications and pushing them back into Charleston as opposed to chasing after Lord Cornwallis, who took the British Army first to Wilmington, North Carolina, and then up into Virginia. So in, um, in the 1st of April, roughly, of 1781, Green moves the ragtag Continental Army that he commands from North Carolina back to South Carolina, and just as Gates had done in 1780, he aimed at Camden, South Carolina. And people say, well, why would he do that? Why Camden of all places? Camden's a very small frontier village at the time, but it's that main British supply depot. And if you're commanding an army that doesn't have much food, doesn't have much lead, doesn't have much gunpowder, doesn't have any shoes, doesn't have many horses, and you can capture a major British supply depot, you've done two things. One, you run the British out of about a quarter of South Carolina, and second, you resupply your army. So Camden is a tempting target for the Americans. When uh, Nathaniel Green came down and, and put his eye on, on Camden, was it just Camden, or did he, uh, did he also look at the other outposts as well at the same time? Nathaniel Green had good correspondence with the partisan commanders that were working in South Carolina, notably Andrew Pickens, Thomas Sumter, and Francis Marion. Uh, those were the uh, general officers, but there were many militia colonels under them who had done yeoman service for liberty when there was no government in South Carolina. So Nathaniel Green, on his way to Camden, detaches Light Horse Harry Lee and his legion and sends Lee to find Francis Marion, join with him, and continue what historians call the War of the Post. And the Post are these smaller British outposts away from Charleston where they maybe have fortified a house or maybe fortified a crossing. Nathaniel Green's War of the Post started when Light Horse Harry Lee and Francis Marion joined forces and lay siege to a post that was between Camden and Charleston, built on top of an Indian mound called Fort Watson. That siege was going on as um, also other partisan actions in the state. Thomas Sumter was active um, working on Granby, which is where Casey is today, and will later also attack and capture Orangeburg. Green, on April the 19th of 1781, 
brings his army to three miles from Camden. Lord Francis Rawdon is in command of the British post at Camden, but Francis Rawdon does not have a huge army assembled here, plus some of the people are in hospitals and are doing uh, more administrative tasks than soldiers. So Rawdon really has at his disposal only about 900 men to defend the fortified village, the storehouses, the jails, and the different um, departments of a field British army. So the setup for the Battle of Hobkirk Hill, called by many of the soldiers the Second Battle of Camden, was that Lord Rawdon is in command of the British forces and Nathaniel Green has a group of people attacking Rawdon's communication line with Charleston and Green moves within three miles of Camden, basically daring the British to come out and fight because Green does not have the strength or the material to attack directly fortified Camden. So uh, let's talk a little bit about that. The way Camden is, is now, we have uh, this field around the Joseph Kershaw House in historic Camden, but from here to Hobkirk Hill, where he, he set up his, his base of operations, which is around just north of what was called Logtown at that time, wasn't there a, I see a lot of trees now. Tell, tell me about the battlefield, or at least historic Camden, back then, the, the fortifications around Camden. Was there a, was it all woods or did they, how, how did they set that up to where they felt like it was not something they could take on head on? Camden was fortified by the British in different stages. British military engineers came here and decided to take logs, stand them up on the end and build a palisaded wall around the historic village. Inside the palisaded wall were houses that were converted to um, um, hospitals, troop houses, and uh, storehouses. Then around the perimeter and a couple hundred yards from the palisade wall were eight readouts built. And a readout is a small earthwork. They're different shapes. Some of them are rectangle, some of them are square, some of them are shaped like home plate. Um, or they're built around an existing building. The buildings in the, con in the uh, converted village of Camden were <clears throat> used by the British as storehouses, jail houses, hospitals, commanders, headquarters, and things like that. <clears throat> around the uh, town was a palisaded wall made of trees locally cut um, to uh, enclose the, um, the central village area. Not only were the trees cut to build the palisade, but of course in the 18th century, there's hardly any other source of energy for cooking, cleaning, um, uh, heating houses. And so most of the trees within about one mile radius of the village were cut down. This also provides a clear field of fire for cannons and rifles and muskets um, from the armed um, village. A military engineer came to Camden and had constructed eight detached small earthworks called readouts that circled the town. These readouts um, were different shapes. Some were square, rectangle, some of them were like home plate with five sides and, and they were Earthworks mounted up with ditch with ditches around them, and a lot of them had um, protective uh, wooden spiked abate and um, other structures to make them defensive in nature. And these um, these also could be around a building. Like immediately north of the village was the jail and the courthouse, which were circled by earthworks and turned into one of these uh, remote readouts. So the village was very highly defended and to take that village would take um, a lot of time. It would take digging siege trenches, which means you have to have shovels and picks and things of that nature. And it would take siege artillery, none of which Green had. He didn't have the food to stay. He didn't have the entrenching um, equipment. 
He did not have with him um, sappers and pioneers who would know how to brace ditches and earthworks and things like that. And he didn't have any heavy, heavy cannons at all. So, um, so doing a siege was not a possibility for Camden. Why, why Hobkirk Hill? Why even go there? Well, when Green first came three miles from Camden, he sent the light infantry under Robert Kirkwood and some cavalry into a small group of houses about one mile north of historic Camden or the site of the Camden village called Logtown. <clears throat> and the night of the 19th and early morning on the 20th, there was heavy skirmishing because the British also had an outpost there. The Americans took that outpost and held it until Green met, moved his army to this open plain about a mile north of town. But when Green got there and looked around, there were a few houses there and some crops, but there were no natural defenses at all. And so he said, well, where can I put my army that gives them a little geographic advantage? And about a mile north of there, or two miles north of, um, of uh, historic Camden Village, was a sandy ridge, which the locals called Hopkirk Hill. And so that hill is maybe um, 60 feet higher than the surrounding plateau, a uh, sandy ridge that runs east and west, crossing the Great Waxhaw Road. So Green moved his army to the top of that hill, once again, in essence, daring the British to come out and attack him. So you said that Rowden had about 900, is that correct, about 900 troops? How many troops did Nathaniel Green bring with him? Well, Nathaniel Green at first had about 2,000, but a lot of them were short-term uh, militiamen from North Carolina. And um, the Continental soldiers that uh, Green had him with, with him were about 1,200 Continentals. Um, there were about 600 to 700 North Carolina militiamen, but half of their enlistments and required duties had expired, so he had to turn them loose at Camden and send them back to North Carolina. So about 1,500 effective soldiers is what he ended up with. And remember, he had deta detached Light Horse Harry Lee and his legion of cavalry and light infantry to work with Francis Marion, so they weren't with his army at Camden. The, uh, the cavalry that was with Nathaniel Green, uh, was that William Washington that was with him? Mm. Yeah, Lieutenant Colonel William Washington, a distant cousin of George Washington, was assigned to Green. William Washington um, had 80 cavalrymen However, he only had 67 cavalry horses at this point, so some of the cavalrymen were actually dismounted acting as light infantry. So um, William Washington was the commander of that, and he will play an important role in the battle. Well, tell us how this battle uh, jumped off. You got uh, Nathaniel Green mm -hmm. setting up on Hobkirk Hill. You got the little town of, the little village of Logtown right, right below that. And then you have Camden, where uh, Lord Rowden is with his 900 people. Tell, tell me where, where it went from there. Well, when Green moved out of Logtown and camped on uh, top of Hopkirk Hill, that was the 20th of April, Green sent parties around Camden on both sides for two reasons. One is he had to forage for food, and he was looking for cows and sheep and anything that he could get to eat, milled grain. And secondly, again, he's pressuring Rawdon to come out and fight outside of the fortified walls by cutting off Camden and isolating Camden. So this goes on. Green actually moves his army to another camp to the southeast of Camden for two days, expecting to interdict um, a detached element of Rawdon's under Colonel Watson. Then he realized that that was not a good defensible place and he didn't want to get caught between two British armies, so he moves back to Hopkirk Hill on the, on the 24th of April. On the 25th of April in the morning, Lord Rawdon had decided to go out and attack Green, and Lord Rawdon's plan was to quietly slip south out of the fort at Camden and go a little south to Pine Tree Creek, turn to the east, go to Little Pine Tree Creek, 
go up the Pine Tree Creek Valley. And the Pine Tree Creek Valley is about 40 vertical feet lower than the plateau of the Camden and his own, kind of sneaking up on Green's either rear or at least east flank. So he does this, this is in broad daylight, and, and Green looks like he sort of anticipated the British will do that because he has a, a trip line, a warning line of the debts put out about a half a mile in front of his battle line, and he has Robert Kirkwood with his light infantry out in front also. So we have two units to watch for Rawdon coming and exactly what was planned happened. That is, Rawdon's units came up to the southeast of Green's battle line. On today's uh, uh, topography and, and the neighborhoods that are on that battlefield now, what road would that uh, would get you closest to where Rawdon came up? Well, Camden is thankfully laid out on a very simple to follow north, south, east, west grid. Mm -hmm. And the main north-south road through Camden is exactly overlaid on the old Indian trail we call the Catawba Path or the Waxhaw, Great Waxhaw Road, or the Great Wagon Road. It has lots of names. And it had been cleared 90 feet wide from Camden to the north all the way across Hopkirk Hill. But that's not the way that uh, Rawdon came. Rawdon went through the swamps up the side, uh, besides Little Pine Tree Creek and um, turned um, from headed north to the northwest to come up in front of, um, of Rawdon. So it's about roughly where Hampton and Fair Street cross is about where Rawdon came up out of the Little Pine Tree Swamp headed to the northwest to get in front of um, Green's battle line. Very good, what happened then? Well, Rawdon, um, Rawdon hit Green's trip wire, and the vedettes gave warning by firing their guns and taking off back to Green's line. So, so for our listeners, when you say trip wire, you're not talking about like in Vietnam where you have a wire set up where the flares go off. You're no, talking they, about <laughs> actual people. These trip wires are actual people <laughs> out. They're vedettes, they're, they're looking. And their, their job is to be the early warning system, but there is a completely manual system. And the only thing they have to make enough noise would be to fire their guns off, which they did, and it worked. Now, Rawdon is not slowed down by any of this, but he does hit Kirkwood's light infantry. And Kirkwood's light infantry at that time was, let's say, 50 men. And Rawdon's got with him about 980 people, so 980 trained British soldiers can push aside 50 light infantrymen, but they're gonna take some casualties, they're gonna make a bunch of racket, and it's gonna slow Rawdon's progress down to give Green the opportunity to call his troops back into battle order and get them um, lined up as they're uh, in their places they're supposed to be. Now this is not South Carolina guerrilla warfare. This isn't Francis Marion ambushing someone. This is linear European battle tactics where we get in a line and we maneuver sort of like modern bands do on the football field or under Friday night lights. Very good. Now Robert Kirkwood was not from South Carolina. Uh, he was not even from North Carolina or Virginia. Where was he from? Well, um, some of the hardest fought battles and some of the best troops that the Southern Campaign featured was the Maryland and Delaware Continental Line. The Maryland and Delaware Continental Line were here in August of 1780 and fought at the Battle of Camden where they took huge casualties. And this whole regiment of Delaware troops was basically um, wounded and captured and escaped down to about two companies. And Robert Kirkwood was the senior captain of those two companies of uh, surviving Delaware troops. And he followed Green into North Carolina and fought at the Battle of um, Guilford Courthouse, came back to South Carolina and fought at um, Hopkirk Hill. 
Now, Kirk, the whole northern end of Camden is named the Kirkwood area after in honor of Robert Kirkwood. Um, Robert Kirkwood was a hero of the revolution from Delaware. If there had been more men in the Delaware um, continental line, he would have been their colonel, and if there had been even more men, he would have been their general. He was that high a quality of, of fighter. So uh, now Kirkwood is being pushed back. His 50, uh, off, 50 men are being pushed back. Uh, what happens then? Nathaniel Green deployed a, along the edge of the hill of Hopkirk Hill, and he had four main uh, infantry regiments. He put two from Virginia on the west side of what is now Broad Street or the Waxhaw Road, and he put his Delaware Continentals on the east side. Those four regiments were the backbone of Green's army. In addition to the, those infantry regiments, he had William Washington's um, uh, cavalry, and he had three pieces of artillery. They were six-pound field carriages. Each one of them has a crew of six or eight men to man them and move them around. So he had Kirkwood acting as light infantry, he had three six-pound cannons, he had 67 horsemen, and he had about um, 900 Continental soldiers and another 250 North Carolina militiamen in reserve. The ones from Maryland, tell me a little bit about them. The, the story of the Maryland line is incredible. And the Maryland line um, fought extremely hard in Long Island, uh, they suffered many, many casualties. Some of the greatest leaders of the American Revolution and some of the hardest fought soldiers of the Revolution came out of the Maryland line. Here at Hobkirk Hill, the Maryland 1st Regiment was commanded by John Gunby, Colonel John Gunby, and he's a controversial figure um, in the Battle of Hopkirk Hill. The second um, Maryland uh, Regiment was uh, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin Ford. Benjamin Ford will be wounded, they thought, slightly in the elbow um, at the early part of the Battle of Hopkirk Hill. Probably just an odd shot caught him, but that turned out to be a fatal wound. Thankfully, his number two was a fellow named John Eager Howard. John Eager Howard will become a political figure, a governor of uh, Maryland, a senator. And John Eager Howard is one of the absolute heroes of the Battle of Cowpens. And so he is back in Camden command, commanding the Maryland Regiment after the fall of um, Lieutenant Colonel Ford. So tell me how the, the, the linear battle transpired from there and how, how it ended up. Well, Rawdon displayed his troops. He's marching probably two by two because he's kind of coming up a path through the swamp. But if you turn that, if you just turn that snake a little bit and go to the west, then you end up in a, in a line. And Green is on a horse on top of Hopkirk Hill and about two or 300 yards below him at the base of the hill, he sees these red coats coming. And he sees that there's not as many of them as he has and that their line is a little short. So Green's plan is simply to take the two regiments on each end of his line, the flanking regiments, and have them swing to the middle like a gate so that they flank the British. Now the reason you want to flank them is if you can, instead of shooting right into their front, if you can shoot into their side and concentrate your, your fire, it's called enfilade fire, then you can capture them uh, very well. So he started that maneuver and he detailed William Washington to ride around the east side of his army, fight any cavalry that um, Rawdon had, which he had about 50 um, New York volunteers that were mounted as cavalry, come around behind the British army and attack them from the rear. So we call that a double envelopment. It's actually a triple envelopment where you basically encircle your enemy and control them in every which way they turn. You have a man there. Now, Rawdon was a great battlefield tactical commander. He saw immediately what Green was doing. And so the way you countered getting flanked on both sides is just make your line longer. And so he spread his line 
from east to west, men crossing Broad Street, or the Great Waxhaw Road, where Green had two six-pound cannon. Now, they're not shooting iron cannonballs. They're shooting like buckshot. They're shooting grape-sized, big grape, golf ball-sized pieces of iron like using a giant um, uh, shotgun. So every time the British would run somebody across the road to move to the west flank, the cannon would fire, and it was very devastating fire. So the British are lined up from about Littleton Street over to uh, about Campbell Street, as far as width goes. That's three quarters of a mile, which means they're spread very thin. And the British start moving up the hill. These are professional soldiers. They're going to go where their officers tell them to and engage the Americans. At the same time, Green has ordered the two center regiments to fix bayonets and come down the hill because, truthfully, in the 18th century, muskets are not a very f accurate or formidable we weapon, but the bayonet on the end of the mo musket will absolutely kill you every time. So there are uh, lots of bayonet fights, knife fights in the American Revolution. Unfortunately, the plan does not work out as Green thought. A favorite officer in Colonel Gunby's 1st Maryland, and this would be the soldiers the closest to Broad Street to the Great Waxhaw Trail, named William Beatty, took an unlucky shot and was instantly killed. Beatty was in command of the two companies of Maryland 1st Regiment that are closest to the Waxhaw Road. When he physically falls, his men falter. He was very much loved, and it was very disturbing to them to see their officer fall. And they should have, by training, kept going, but they didn't. So the other companies in that regiment, some of them slowed down, some of them kept going, but all of a sudden, all of a sudden instead of having a straight line of organized men coming down the hill towards you, you now have a disorder in the line. Lord Rawdon saw that disorder and he ordered two of his regiments to attack the, that one spot. If you look at rugby and, um, and see the old flying wedge or 1930s football, that's what they're doing is the flying wedge right to the weakest point, right where Captain William Beatty was killed. The two British regiments could not break through and separate Green's army. So Rawdon threw a third regiment into that flying wedge to try to break the two wings of Green's army. He was successful. So once Green's army was divided in half, instead of the Americans enveloping the British, you have the British putting that wedge between the two wings and can start dividing the American army and do enfilade fire on the Americans. So Green, seeing that mess, after about 15 to 20 minutes of fighting, decided that he must withdraw his army. And so he was able to have enough command over the troops to make a fighting and orderly withdrawal. But in the end, this, this battle happened between about 11.15 and or about 11 o'clock and 11.15 11.20. In the end, Green ends off backing off the battlefield. So a technical victory for Lord Rawdon. He now controls a sand dune north of Camden. No big deal. But Green protects his army. He protects his army as a fighting unit. But didn't Green send William Washington back onto the battlefield? I mean, from a, I mean, if, if the British are technically claiming that they own the battlefield, can they really say that if William Washington came back onto the battlefield? Well, trust me, in the sandlands of South Carolina, if you own a sand dune, you don't own very much. And, and, and so it was a victory that was bought at the cost of about 25, 28% of Rawdon's men, and he didn't have any, and he couldn't get any replacements to control a sand dune that you couldn't even grow a blackjack on. And so it's a victory that meant nothing. It meant everything that Green was still a fighting condition. So all during the afternoon, as Green's army moves north to treat the wounded and 
handle the prisoners that they, they had taken and to have a place for the American soldiers who escaped to rally to, which a number of them did, um, he sent Washington back south. Toward the end of the day of April 25th, 1781, Rawdon um, had actually detached John Coffin, his cavalry commander, to go up to Hob Hobkirk Hill. They were probably looking for the Americans' cannon, one of which was um, still on, somewhere up on the hill or hidden up there. And Washington laid an ambush for them. Washington had his cavalry and a few infantrymen with him and was able to rout the British cavalry and run them all the way back into, into fortified, what we call historic Camden now, the village of Camden. So if, if, if the test is, did Green control the hill in the end? Yes, he did. But Green was smart enough to know that controlling that hill didn't mean anything, and all he was trying to do is entice the British out. So Rawdon, the victor of the day, and Green chased each other around the countryside a bit. But Rawdon knew that Lee and Marion were between he and communication with Charleston. The Fort Watson fell to Lee and Marion. Lee and Marion had gone across the Congaree River and laid siege to Fort Watson and Rawdon knew that he was in an untenable position. So on the 10th day of May, he burned the fortifications and a lot of the houses um, in the historic colonial village, left marching toward Charleston down the east side of the Watery and then down the east side of the Santee River. So although Green didn't technically by 18th century definition win the battle, he won the war because that knocked the British out of a fourth of South Carolina. And the victories at Fort Watson and at ultimately at Fort Mott, at Fort Granby, and then um, Orangeburg cleared about a third of the state of any British presence so that Green was the ultimate victory. Thank you so much for talking to us. And uh, Hobkirk Hill is, like we had said, uh, one of those uh, chapters that has been lost to the, a lot of the history books, but was uh, so paramountly important to the Southern campaign and to the rise of Nathaniel Green and uh, liberty for America. So thank you very much. Thank you.